We have been looking over the last several weeks at um, the, 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 the phrase that we use is how we can experience God. It's a difficult it's a difficult thing to put into words. How can I experience God? And the best way that we have found to describe what we're talking about is from the scripture. I just want to read to you this verse. Uh, Job 42.5 says, Job speaks and says, I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Uh, Job had heard all kinds of things about God, and Job had a religious relationship with God. He did regular sacrifices, regular fast, regular prayer meetings, regular religious activities. And then he went through uh, hell on earth. And, uh, and during that time, he was accused of being a sinful man who would refuse to repent. And there was a great deal of conversation about, about God. A great deal of religious talk about God by Job and all of his friends. I remember Kerry Kobe one time saying, I don't want to talk about God anymore as if he were not in the room. Job and his friends talked about God as if he were far away and not listening. And one day, Job just appeared, or God just appeared in their midst, and God spoke. And at that point, Job goes, now, now, I know you. When we talk about experience God, it's the difference between knowing of God and knowing God. So in these, this series of messages, it is how can we move from the religious activities about God and get into, as God describes it, face-to-face, breath-to-breath with him. We've uh, seen some principles that help us to know that it's possible. Some principles in his universe that if we understand, enable us to move into that realm of experiencing God. One of those principles is this. uh, From John chapter 5, Jesus says these words, My Father is working until now and I am working. At this moment, in this room, and outside of this room, In this room right now and outside of this room, God is doing something to someone. Now, when you get that as an understanding of the environment you live in, you live in a place where God is constantly at work. Just that understanding helps us to move from religion to relationship. He is not far away. He is not hard of hearing. He's not on vacation. He's in control. Another truth that we learned was that God himself pursues a love relationship with us. First of all, he gives us the command, you are to love me. And as soon as we begin moving in that command, he reciprocates in his word, and says, here's how I prove my love for you. While you were yet sinners, Christ died for you. The communion table we just had is a proclamation of God's love for you. So there is a command for you to love him and a proclamation of his love for you. This is not theory. This is, this is the world you live in and the God who rules it. This week, we're going to look at another truth, which is that as God is doing his work to this very day, he invites us to join him in his work. He invites us to join him in his work. Turn to Philippians chapter 2, verse 13, please. I'm going to read it first of all in the English Standard Version. It says, For it is God who works in you 
both to will and to work for his good pleasure. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Does somebody have a New International Version? Would you read it loud, Brandon? God working in, and that's that's the gist of the sentence. God is working in you in order for you to accomplish his purposes. Let's consider this for a moment. First of all, let us just confess this. God does not need anyone's help. Would you agree with me? And in fact, if he's going to get something done, it would probably be a lot easier for him to do it without my help. Would you agree? If God wants to get something done, he can just speak, let there be light, and there is light. He doesn't need me to light a candle, right? But he chooses to work through his people. He doesn't need us, but this is how he likes doing it. Now, here's the thing. When you're the author, you kind of get to do what you want to. He created the universe and he created us in his image. And the very first thing that it says is he put us in the garden to work it. Work is not part of the curse. Work is part of the blessing of life. Work is ordained. Work is glorious. In fact, if I want to increase the suicide rate in the United States of America, what I would do is give everybody a guaranteed income and take all of their jobs from them. And the suicide rate would skyrocket. Why? Because we were created in the image of God and God is at work and he works through us. Let us consider for a moment some examples of that. Do you remember... In fact, turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3. Look at verse 7 and following. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out of the land to a good broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And, be, and now behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me and I have seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppress them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh. Now God says, I have seen the affliction. He says in verse 8, I have come down to deliver them. Here's the work. Here's what I'm going to do. Does he need Moses? But what does he do? I'm going to go deliver them. Moses, get to work. Or what about when God uh, decides to move and create a nation who's going to bring about a Messiah who will be the salvation for mankind? What does he do? He's going to make a nation. What does he do? He calls Abraham. Does he need Abraham to make a nation? No, because Jesus said, out of these rocks I can raise up children to sing my praises. I don't need to make a nation out of a human being. I can make people out of dirt. But he's going to do this great move. What does he do? He calls a human and says, I'm going to work through you. What about Mary? Does he need Mary in order to give flesh to his son? No. But he's doing a great work, which God becoming flesh, the divine identifying with a fallen humanity. And what does he do? He sends an angel. Mary, you're my vessel. And what does Mary say? Whatever you want, Lord. 
This is how he does things. He chooses what he's going to do, and then he picks somebody and says, let's go do this together. Why does he do that? Well, remember the, the second thing we looked at, God's pursuing a love relationship. Mitch just got through saying, okay, I'm going to tell you the rest of the story. I said to Mitch, Mitch, so I'd like you to work on ceiling tiles and I'm going to send Caleb, and it was Chachi, right? It was the little guy. Caleb and Chachi to work with you. And Mitch goes, I've never done ceiling tiles. And Mitch didn't know Caleb and Chachi. But Mitch worked with Caleb yesterday, and he's standing here today so impressed with that young man that he calls him out. See, Mitch got to know Caleb as they worked together. God's pursuing a love relationship with you. So what does he say? I'm getting ready to do something in El Paso, Texas. So I'm going to call you, Jared. And you and I are going to do it together. Are you okay with that? This is the universe you were born into. And, and this is the personality of the creator who brought you into existence. Now, where we get in trouble is in religion, we tend to end up with a very self-centered relationship rather than a God-centered relationship. First of all, let me describe to you a God-centered relationship. It goes like this. We have confidence in God. When you tell me, you know, Pastor, I just don't think I can do that. I'm just afraid that it's too big for me. That's what caused the spies and the Israelites to come under God's judgment. Is they said, there's, yes, it's a beautiful land, it's a wonderful land, we know God's giving it to us, but there are giants in the land, they're too big for us. We can't beat them. See, they did not have confidence in God's ability. Joshua and Caleb did. They said, we can take the land because God will defeat the giants. A God-centered life has a confidence in God. It also has a dependence on God and his abilities. When you talk to me and you say to me, I just don't know how I'm going to be able to pay the bills. Or you say, yes, I would love to put my kid in a private school, but I just don't have enough money. It's because you're self-centered. You're looking at your own abilities. You're looking at your own resources. If God tells you to put his kid, not yours, his kid in a private school, then you just say, yes, Lord, and you put his kid in the private school, and he provides the funds. Doing the work of God, which parents the number one job you have is raising his children to know these things I'm teaching you today. Doing the work of God requires a dependence on him and a confidence in his ability. A God-centered life is also a life focused on God and his activity, not on you and your activity. With you, you may have dreams and ambitions. I'd like to build a business. I'd like to expand my business. I'd like to get a warehouse for my business. And it's all about you and your activities. A God-centered life is, God, what size business do you want? God may say, I'd kind of like to have a personal, up-close business where you can actually interact with your customers. I'd like to have an anti-Amazon. Same thing with the church. When a pastor is self-centered, he's trying to build a church, he's trying to build his fame. How many people can we get? How many buildings can we have? But when a pastor is God-centered, he's saying, how many people do you want here? And who do you want working with Mitch on the ceiling tiles? <laughs> and it wasn't just Mitch. Uh, Charlie, who did, who did Charlie have working with him? Ezra. Charlie had never spent much time with Ezra. Charlie, anyway. It went well, I heard. <laughs> In a God-centered life, there is humility before God. There is not arrogance in a God-centered life. I mean, after all, look at how big and beautiful he is and try to be proud standing next to him. In a, a God-centered life, a person is seeking first the kingdom of God. That's what their motive is, seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. 
in a in a God centered life, we are speak, seeking God's perspective on the events that are taking place in my life. Do, do you see this? I, that the workday is just such a perfect example. Did we get to work yesterday in order to get some things fixed on the building? Well, yes, but what was God's perspective? We had a work day yesterday, so He could work on His building. Because this is not his building. This is his building. And he had a work day yesterday, and he called us and we participated. Now, on the other hand, well, one more thing about a God centered life. Listen closely to this one. If a person has a God centered life, they have a holy and godly life, and sin is left behind. If you're going to walk with God, Leave the stinky stuff behind. You see the difference? You got to leave your sins behind. Either choose to walk with Him or choose to wallow in a cesspool, but you can't do both. In a self centered life, the life is focused on self. There's a lot of pride in self and personal accomplishments. There's a self-confidence or a lack of it. When somebody says, oh, I just can't do anything, that's a self-centered life. When somebody says, I can do anything, that's a self-centered life. When somebody says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, that's a God-centered life. In a self-centered life, we are depending on ourselves and one's own abilities rather than on God. Now let's just consider, when we talk about perspective between the God-centered and the self-centered life, are you ready? Watch this. When we talk about the life of Abraham, it is true that through all of those chapters of the book of Genesis, we see Abraham growing in his knowledge and understanding of the Lord. He's lying about his wife being a sister in one place, and then he's suddenly, you know, on a mountaintop. And it just you just see him growing in his faith. You got the whole thing with with having a baby through somebody we shouldn't, and then you've got the miraculous baby. You've got all kinds of stuff going on in his life, but you need to understand this. The story that is written in the book of Genesis is not about Abraham. It's about God working, and Abraham's a part of that work, which is going to be picked up by his son and his grandson, and that work is continuing today, and now you're walking in Abraham's shoes. The story of the Bible is not about the people in the Bible, although we can learn a great deal about how to walk with God. The story of the Bible is God is walking with someone and you're up. He's working in a yoke. And it's your turn to join him in his work. Now, when we see God working around us, when he reveals to us what he's getting ready to do, like he did with Abraham, he said, I'm getting ready to go knock down Sodom and Gomorrah. I'm getting ready, he says to Gideon, I'm getting ready to deliver the Israelites from their adversaries. He says to Jeremiah, I'm getting ready to bring judgment on Israel. He, he finds someone and he tells them, I'm doing this. I'm getting ready to bring the teenagers at New Life Christian Academy, into a deep relationship with me. We see him doing it right now. That is our invitation to join him in that work. But when we join him, we don't join him and go, okay, God, I got it. I see the vision. I got it. Okay, step out of the way. Let me take this from here. No, it is time to submit to doing the work his way, because he's the one who's going to do the work. Listen to Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 through 9. God says, Isaiah 55, 8 through 9, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declare the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Who would have come up with the battle plan to take Jericho that we're going to march around the city for seven days and blow trumpets. What general? Would, would MacArthur have come up with that battle plan? He doesn't do the work the way we would do it, so you better let him 
give you the plan. Because he likes to do it in a way that, that when it's, the work is done, everybody can go, well, God must have been here today. You've got to stop grabbing the work of God and going, okay, let's put together, let's put together a committee and let's, you know, let's do a questionnaire of our neighborhood. And then after we do that questionnaire, let's get some board members together and pick some wealthy ones because they tend to contribute to the ministry. And then after we get the board members together, let's figure out how many candy bars we need to sell to get this job done. Well, that's how we do business. The way God does business is he sends manna out of heaven or places gold coins in a fish's mouth or has a little boy with some fish and some bread. Stop doing it our way and we'll finally get to see God moving in our midst. Find out what the work is and then find out how he wants to do it and join him in it. Psalms 81, verse 13 and 14 says, Oh, that my people would listen to me. That Israel would walk in my ways. Then I would soon subdue their enemies and turn my hands against their foes. When we walk with him in his ministries, we first of all, he defines for us what success is. He says, here's what I would consider to be success. You might have thought a lot of people in your church, a lot of buildings, a big offering, missionary work, but that maybe that's your definition of success. That's my, not my definition of success. My definition of success is a worship service that someone can come to during COVID and sing out loud. Mitch, would you have said, would you have said, you know what, we're going to build a church where when, when a pandemic hits. No. Who comes up with that plan? His work, his ways are so much more beautiful. We have to, we have to find out how to walk his ways. And when we do that, then we begin to experience that success the way that he defines it. Now listen again. First of all, we learn his ways and we walk in them. Here's his definition of success. Then we see the success and how he brings it about and we go, man, that was amazing. And he goes, do you get it? Because do you know that Jesus Christ is still rabbi? He is still teacher and that it's his joy to teach us the Father's ways? Would you look at 2 Corinthians, please, chapter 5? 2 Corinthians, chapter 5. As well as understanding that God is, has a work that he's doing, and as well as understanding that he invites us into that work, and as well as understanding that his, his work is going to be done his ways and not our ways, there's another thing that we have to understand. What is his work? What is his work? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 19 through 20. Paul says, That is, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God is making his appeal through us. We implore you, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. God is reconciling the world to himself. He has called us to join him in that work as ambassadors bringing the message of reconciliation so that someone can be reconciled. The work of God is saving lost souls. He tells Peter, I will make you fishers of men. Now, he can save lost souls as you're doing the laundry. He can save lost souls in any number of ways, but you need to understand this. His business, the family business, is reaching out and saving lost souls. And you're in the family, then you're part of that business. Now here are some tips that I want to share with you. Just some things that we find that work when we try to, when we try to join him in his work. 
First of all, this, tip number one, as God's obedient child, you are in a love relationship with him. And in his timing, he will show you where he is working so you can join him in his timing. You may say, God, just send me anywhere. God, I hear the call. God, I, w- I want to become your servant. I want, I want to get at it. Send me anywhere. Moses waited 40 years on the backside of the desert in his timing. In his timing. Remain faithful, tip number two, remain faithful in what he has told you to do, no matter how small or seemingly insignificant it may appear. You may say, I want to preach to the nations. I want, I want to fill coliseums uh, with people and preach the gospel and watch multitudes come to receive Christ as their Savior. And he says, uh, yeah, that's great. I'd like you to talk to the guy across the street. He who is faithful in a little will be given much. He who is not faithful in a little, even what he has will be taken away, Jesus tells us. I want to I preach to the nations. Okay, what about the people in your office? Well, no. I, I mean, I'm talking about I want coliseums. What about the person at the laundromat? Well, that's not a coliseum. Let's start with the laundromat, shall we? Could we? Be faithful in what he's told you to do. Another thing I'd like you to consider in these tips, Jesus was 12 when he began about being about his father's business. Do you remember he told Mary and Joseph, didn't you know I had to be about my father's business? He was 12. He didn't start his ministry until he was 30. What did he do in between those years? Well, he was a carpenter. He was also a big brother. He was probably the man of the house taking care of his mother during those years. He was faithful in what God had given him until the moment that God launched him into ministry. Another thing I want you to think about in this waiting, it's a time of preparation. Listen to the words of Peter, okay? In your waiting, there's a time of preparation. Sorry. I'm watching Dustin look at me. And he's soaking all of this up because God has called him to ministry and he wants to get on with it and he's listening right now going, tell me, Pastor. I mean, he's leaning forward in the chair staring at me. Okay, here we go. Just Dustin. The rest of the message is just for you, buddy. The rest of you, I'm sorry. Listen to what Peter said. Are you ready, Dustin? Peter said, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. And in response, Jesus warned him, the rooster will crow, will not crow to tell you until you deny me three times. Was Peter ready? No. But did, get, did Peter end up getting ready? And that crash was a big part of getting him ready. If you're going to join God in his work, let him take the time to mold you And molding you frequently is done with fire and heartache. See, a God-centered relationship is, Lord, I want to be involved in your work. And he said, it's going to make you bleed. And you say, nevertheless, I would rather be bleeding standing next to you than be whole and healthy in my own little world. Next tip, waiting on the Lord should not be an idle time for you. Let God use times of waiting to mold and shape your character. Here's another tip. It comes as a question. Are you ready? Is it possible for God to be active around you and you not recognize it? You remember Elisha and his servant? 
Here Elisha is surrounded by this massive angelic host who's getting ready to go to war against the people that are after Elisha and the servants going, what are we going to do? And Elisha has to say, he doesn't see the work of God. God, will you open his eyes? And then he could see that magnificent angelic army. It's impossible. You're saying, I don't see where God's working right now. Well, one, you may not be looking. Two, you may not have trained your eyes to see the spiritual. You only see the physical. And three, you may not have asked, where is God working right now? In every one of your lives, you have many people that you're in relationship with. You'll see one of them have a crisis or ask a question. There will be a moment when they're open. You guys, for many of you, you're taking with your brothers and your cousins and everything a baseball bat of the gospel, and every time you enter a room where they're in, you beat them about the head and shoulders with it. For those of you who are doing that, let me read a Bible verse to you. Now, you know I'm all for sharing the gospel. But when the guy's got knots on his heads and he's saying, would you leave me alone? Let this verse speak to you. John 6.46 says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Now you, you present the gospel, and then they say, No, 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 and you're frustrated, and you go, Man, the next time I see you, I'm going to hit you twice. And they say, Don't ever talk to me about your God again. That's the time to go into the closet and close the door and get on your knees and begin praying and waiting for the Lord, and you'll see an activity take place in their life. Something will happen that you know it's God and no one else, and that's the moment that you come to them and say, how can I help you? And they say, well, can you can you help me with this? Absolutely. And then they say, tell me one more time about this God you believe in. Final tip. When God does reveal to you what he is doing, that is the time for you to respond. How many times has has God said to me, I want you to go talk to this fellow, and I go, as soon as the show's over. No, I'm sure you're not really telling me to go talk to him. I was planning to meet with him next week anyway. The moment that God says, I want you to go talk to this fellow, right then you drop everything and move. This is one of the number one reasons why you don't experience working together with God. Because when he tells you to move, as they used to say in the army, when I say jump, what is the rest of it? You ask how high on the way up. It's how it needs to be with God. There's some hindrances to experiencing to God that we've talked about here. I just want to remind you of things we've talked about, some hindrances to experiencing him in this aspect. One is by by living in a self-centered fashion where everything you see is about you instead of him. The second one is, is not answering his invitation to join him when he gives you the invitation. And the third one is not submitting to doing things his ways and following his plans once you do join him. How many of you who were here a couple weeks ago when in the message we all saw this beautiful, great proposal? Raise your hand if you were here when we saw the proposal. Where did I, I exp- Raise them up high. I want to see how many. All right, good. Almost all of us. We saw this beautiful proposal, and Patty said, if I had never received Christ before today, today I would have received Christ. And today I want to share with you a great invitation. I'm talking to believers right now. I'm talking to believers. There's a great invitation. Would you turn in your Bibles, please, to Matthew chapter 11? I'd like to say something else real quickly. You may be here right now. I've had people, we've had people say, walk out of the church, walk out of this church and say, man, that was more than I was looking for. I just wanted a song. And somebody to make me feel good. He's talking about relationships and eternal, you know, relationships on nearness to God. This is more than what I want in religion. When you look at the magnitude 
of his death on the cross to make your relationship possible, shouldn't it be a little bit bigger than that? Shouldn't it be something eternal and infinite and glorious, deep and wide and filled with love? Isn't it time to set aside our petty little inch-high thoughts of religion and look at the cross where the only begotten Son of God, he who knew no sin, became sin for you and say, I think he had something big planned for him and I. And step into the grand. In Matthew chapter 11, starting in verse 28, Jesus cries out and says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. <clears throat> Let me just talk to you for a moment about reality here. This thing's driving me nuts. The way that you were born is as a slave to sin and death with a slave master. And he hates you. And he piles on you sin and guilt and death and brokenness. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. It's like when the children of Israel were in Egypt and their bondage was so heavy that they cried out to God, well, you're going to not only make bricks, but you're going to make bricks without straw. Let me make your life as hard as I can because I, Satan, hate you, image bearer of God. And he lays this heavy yoke upon you. That's how you were born. Christ cries into that and says, Come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden. There's this invitation, he says to us, come over here, take that yoke of slavery to sin and hangovers and broken health and broken relationship and poverty. Take, take that, that, that yoke of depression and futility off and come over here and take my yoke upon you. And when you step in, he's in the yoke with you. Because his yoke is a two-holer. Two this is why he says, see, some of you got that, didn't you? <laughs> some of you have been around for a while before indoor plumbing. You got that, didn't you? There is a certain uh, nearness. <laughs> Let me move on. When you take his yoke upon you, what? Okay, God is always at work. Jesus says, my father is always at work and I'm working too. And he's in a yoke with the plow and he's plowing the father's field. And he sees you over there under bondage and says, come here. Take my yoke. It is so light and it is so easy. Why? Because I'm the one doing the pulling. Well, then why am I here if you're doing all the work? So you can walk this field with me. And you and I are going to talk about fields, and we're going to talk about butterflies, and we're going to do this together, and our Father is watching us plow the field, and he's pleased, and I'm pleased, because it was always about you being next to me. When you, when you join the invitation to join him in his work, you are stepping out of the self-centered, heavy yoke of slavery and stepping into a partnership with your creator, your savior, and your king. He is so different from that king. This king loves you and wants to be with you daily. That's the invitation. But the only way 
you could join him in that invitation is to leave your work behind and step into his work. Well, how do I do that? I'm a, I'm a school teacher. Be a school teacher for him. Well, I, I run a business. Make it his. Well, I'm a mother. Give him your children. And then join him in the work. Does everybody see that? What did you hear today? Yes, Brandon. No. Where's and where's Patrick? Patrick, what are you using for a text? What are you using for a text? Oh, look. <laughs> We're basically using the same book, right, called the Bible. But yes, it must be important. Good point. All right. Ask him how high on the way up. Very good. Very good. Who else heard something today? Yes. Ah. Uh, yes. Share the word. They don't get it. Go into prayer. Don't give up. Go into prayer. Oh, uh, wait, wait. And fasting. You you say you love them. Go into prayer. And fasting because they cannot come to the Father unless he draws them. Right? And I love it. As soon as Jesus says that, by the way, as soon as Jesus says, no one comes to me unless the Father draws them, he immediately goes, any who will may come. Isn't that great? One more. What did you hear today? Yes. Okay, three more. Wait for his timing, Patrick. Uh huh. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yes. He's still going to get it done, isn't he? Okay, Rosie. You had said you were. You had something. Yes. Wait. He's passionately, actively involved in getting you passionately and actively involved in his life. <laughs> yes. Right. Right. All right. Now we're going to do something a little bit different, and this is going to be hard. Okay? You saw how I put Mitch to work. Now I'm putting all of you to work. All right? We just said to each other what we heard. How do we say that into a prayer? to respond to him, what he's speaking to, through Patrick and I to this church right now. He's saying something to this church right now. And it is, we, we need to respond, not to each other, we need to respond to him. Let's go into prayer.